Coming up next, we have the folks from Youth to See to talk about uh, plastic pollution uh, solutions. Um, let me see, I think I have a little bit uh, that I can read to you if my um, Google Chrome will cooperate for a second. Um, so Youth to See is a youth-based initiative uh, group connecting youth from across British Columbia, united under the common goal of wanting to protect and conserve our oceans. Um, and so as part of their session, they're going to show the audience how they're doing this work, how I'm working to eliminate single-use plastics uh, through an interactive scavenger hunt and a homemade beeswax wrap DIY activity. So we're going to have some more interactive um, stuff from this group and uh, we're going to pass it off to them in just one second. Hey folks, welcome. Hello. Hi. I'm gonna pass it off to you all to introduce yourselves and uh, take it from there. All right, cool. So hi everyone. Um, our names are Carrie, uh, Yonatan, and Natasha, and we are the members from Youth to See. Can I share my screen? Yeah, just give us one second. Can everyone see the screen? So I'm going to talk. Yep. Yep. Carrie. Okay. All right, sweet. All right, so our session is about solutions to plastic pollution. And a quick introduction of each of us. Hi, everyone. My name is Carrie Chu, and I am a university student from Vancouver, Canada. And I got into ocean conservation work from my love for bodies of water. And that has led me to learn more about the oceans and the marine animals that live there. I hope to be able to change the perception of youth into realizing the importance of the health of our oceans, and that way we can take action to make a difference. All right. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Natasha Singh. I'm a grade 12 student uh, from Vancouver, Canada, and my love for the ocean and all of its marine life has led me to become more involved with ocean conservation efforts, and I hope to inspire my peers to do the same. Hi, um, I'm Yonatan. I do, my love for the ocean has come from doing conservation work and I really want to educate the youth about uh, the importance of our ecosystems in the ocean. All right, so we are part of Youth to Sea Council and that's where we conduct ocean service projects and they are essentially projects where we are trying to promote the wealth, sorry, the well-being of our oceans. And we do so by aiming to educate youth from across the Lower Mainland about what we can do to protect the oceans. There's also a youth leadership program, which is a volunteer program where youth will be mentored by OceanWise staff to gain and develop leadership skills to become environmental leaders. So Youth to Sea is actually hosted at the Vancouver Aquarium. Um, which is in the middle of a forest in the middle of the city. Uh, so that's kind of rare. So the Vancouver Aquarium has been open for over 50 years and it was the first aquarium in the world to be credited by ASA, which is the organization uh, with all the zoos and aquariums. So in 2017, OceanWise was founded. OceanWise runs the Vancouver Aquarium. They also run a few other aquariums and many research efforts around the world. They also run the Marine Mammal Rescue Center. So the Marine Mammal Rescue Center uh, helps rehabilitate and rescue uh, injured marine mammals or large marine species uh, across the Northwest Pacific. Uh, so we've rescued anywhere from sea lions to sea turtles to false killer whales. So right now I'm gonna ask you guys, we're gonna do a little bit of scavenger hunt. So for the next two minutes, I want you guys to go look around your house for pieces of plastic. They can be anything like single use plastics, stuff like that. And then once you find them, write them in the chat for us to uh, talk about. So you guys have two minutes to do that. Uh, as we're finding that, we can also talk a little bit about uh, plastics. So in 
like in our oceans, it's estimated that in 30 years, there'll be more plastics in our water than fish that we have. So that's a major concern, obviously. Um, yeah, so if you want to switch the slide over. Yeah. So uh, plastics in our oceans is a major concern because when plastic in our ocean, they don't break down, they break up which leads to microplastics in our environment. Uh, you can go back to the previous slide, it's okay. Yeah, uh, so microplastics are a major effect in our oceans. Uh, I'll talk about it a little more after we finish the scavenger hunt. So with the scavenger hunt, we're just looking for anything you have. Okay, so uh, one of our coordinators here sent us something. Okay, so a toothbrush, a bread bag, and a spray bottle. Two very, or three very different things. Okay, uh, Carrie, do you want to do one of them? Um, which one would you like? Uh, you do, do you want to do the toothbrush? Sure. <laughs> All right, so with toothbrush, that, um, so in plastic usage, there's single-use plastic and there's multi-use plastics. And with toothbrush, and sorry, with toothbrush, that one is a multi-use plastic where there are other alternatives you can use, such as bamboo toothbrush, and those ones are wooden, and it is actually a lot more durable than plastic. Plastic's a little more brittle, so an alternative to using a plastic toothbrush would be a bamboo toothbrush. Okay, and then we have uh, plastic drink containers. So we hear a lot about having to reuse or trying to get metal containers. Uh, so that's a good thing. But if you happen to buy a plastic bottle, if you're extremely thirsty or something that does happen, uh, keep that plastic bottle and use it again and again, because they can still be reused even if you buy them just off the store. Okay, what a food packaging. Matt, do you want to do one? Yeah, sure, for food packaging? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so for food packaging, you can always use, like, I have this just with me right now. I have um, something that's reusable. Um, so you don't always have to use, like, plastic bags. You can always find some reusable alternatives because there are lots out there. Um, and we're going to be showing you a reusable alternative to plastic wrap later today. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a lot of um, things you can use instead of something that's single use. And just like a side note for food packaging, when you go shopping at the grocery market, sorry, at the grocery store somewhere, um, instead of buying individually packed items, you can also try going for bulk. Whenever things are individually packed, chances are it's also individually secured in plastic wrap. And with bulk items, it's not as much plastic wrap used. So Bailey found wrappers, old scraps of paper, old notes, and more, um, especially for the old scraps of paper and the notes. Uh, I personally use old scraps of paper uh, to use as the bottom of projects I do if I do anything with dirt or anything. Um, so I, for example, I made a compost bin and I used tiny pieces of paper to put on the bottom so it doesn't get completely dirty and I can just pick it up and take it out. So if, and also for wrappers, you can use wrappers as almost seals for things. Uh, so it's still being used. And that's a way you can, instead of having to just immediately throw it out, you don't need to go and buy more wrapper or something. Okay, food packaging. Nalgene water bottle. Okay. Should we move on? Or yeah. Let's... There are a few other options. Uh, we can move on. Okay. Okay. So, so as we can see, uh, plastics have come in many different shapes or sizes. So, plastic is essential. I will be honest. In our normal environment, in our environment that we're in now, it is an essential need. Uh, in future, we may be able to change that, but at this moment, it is. So when we throw out plastic or, or even try to recycle it, often doesn't end up where we think it does. Sometimes it doesn't go to the recycling depot or anything. It ends up in the ocean. 
An estimated 8 million tons of plastic go in our ocean every year. And that number is growing rapidly. We see videos and news articles about the large pieces of plastic in our oceans, such as Garbage Island, uh, which is nearly three times the size of Texas, I believe. But in reality, microplastics are the real issue. So when plastics go into our ocean, they break, they break up, they don't break down. And they break up to, into things called microplastic. Microplastics are smaller than a grain of rice. And there are three main kinds of microplastic. There are fibers, microbeads, and fragments. So fragments are pieces of large plastic that break up and into small pieces. So examples of this would be like a bucket gets in our ocean and starts just snapping. And over time, it breaks up into these tiny little fragments, which can then get into our ecosystems. Synthetic fibers come from your clothes. So when you run your laundry, it gets sucked into the sewage system. And when it gets out, it escapes into, through the water treatment into our oceans. And that's highly concerning. Or it can come through street runoff, which is just the normal uh, drain, drains you see on the side of your roads. And then the third kind of plastic is microbeads. And microbeads are especially dangerous because they're in products we don't know they're in. Microbeads are commonly found in most of our hygiene products, such as toothpaste, makeup, sunscreen, deodorant, and they're imp almost impossible to see. They're smaller than five millimeters and they are ultra thin. So anytime you use products like that, make sure you, they have no microbeads in them. And a lot of times products will say they don't have microbeads, but they'll never say they do have microbeads. So you want to keep an eye out for what it is. So here we can see the eco, like the food system of plastics. So plastics will become eaten by small shrimp or krill or zooplankton's. And those planktons are then eaten by larger uh, animals and make its way up the food chain. Studies have shown that nearly 90% of coastal birds uh, are found with pieces of plastic in them. So with these plastics, the birds can take them anywhere in the world because they are anywhere in the world. Uh, further up the food chain, we see the stomachs of large marine mammals. Uh, we see a lot of plastic in them. In a, uh, in a beached whale, a sperm whale found in Scotland, there is a hundred kilograms of plastic found in his stomach. So that is extremely high. Or in Philippines, there is a beaked whale with nearly 90 pounds of plastic that blocked his intestines. So it made it so he couldn't eat or couldn't move. So in British Columbia, which is where we're from, we have a lot of different marine mammals. We have seals, sea lions, and a lot of the issues is we see rope and string tied around their necks. So when this happens, it can lead to infection uh, because their skin will start growing over it. Uh, and then it also entraps them and makes it so it's harder for them to breathe or to hunt. Uh, that's why we have the Marine Mammal Rescue Center is to help uh, conserve them. So it's an estimated that one in three marine mammal species can be found with wrapped in ocean debris. So of course, although there's some major issues in our environment right now, uh, there are people trying to work on conservation efforts and ways that we can help save and fix our plastic situation. So Natasha will talk about how we can help our environments with healthy alternatives. Natasha? One second. 
All right, hi everybody. Um, sorry, my internet's a little tricky today, so I might cut out, cut back in. Um, but after hearing about all of the bad things that are happening in our oceans, let's talk about some of the positive things we can do to help eliminate plastic pollution in our oceans, like substituting single-use plastics for reusable, um, reusable alternatives. Today I'm gonna show you guys um, how to do a demo that you can do on your own time, so you don't have to follow along with me right now what I'm doing. Um, but it's a demo on how to make reusable beeswax extracts, like the one I have here. And therefore, um, they can go over like bowls and things where you can make, put food in them. Um, and it's just a reusable alternative to plastic wrap or cling wrap, which I don't know if you guys know what this is, but it's basically just very thin plastic. Um, and it sticks to itself and it's commonly used to put over food or bowls. Um, so the, the materials you're going to need are beeswax. So you can get this um, online or at places like Amazon. I think you can get it at Walmart, not really sure. Um, you'd have to look into it where it is in your area because we got this from somewhere very local in Vancouver. It's called um, the Honey Main Street Honey Shop. So you can get it there if you're from Vancouver. Or you can, I don't know where you can get it when you're from, but um, yeah, just do a little research because it is kind of hard to come by. You're going to need a grater. So we got this grater. Um, it was thrifted locally from Vancouver. Um, as you can see, it's taken quite a beating. <laughs> so you might not want to use your good grader for this activity. I don't know if you have a good grader, but... The next thing is an iron. Um, so we also got this iron from a thrift store. It was $7.99. And um, it's just, it's handy to have something that you can kind of wreck in case um, you get messy. So I'm just gonna... Here. You're also going to need wax paper. So you can get a wax paper um, supermarket. I'm not really sure uh, where you can get this if you're from a different part of that's not America, North America. But um, yeah, I'm thinking made of cotton. Um, you can get paper from somewhere that recycles fabric. You can also use like a cotton shirt. I made this one out of a cotton shirt and it worked pretty well. So really it just has to be made out of cotton and has to be pretty thin. So I wouldn't recommend using like a really thick towel or anything like that. And then you're gonna need a baking sheet. So this was also sourced uh, from the store in Vancouver. And you can pretty much find baking sheets anywhere. If your parents are really into making cookies, then um, you're probably gonna have one in your house. And it's really just to protect the table because it can get pretty messy. So the instructions are pretty easy. You can, um, so the first instruction is to prep the cotton cloth by cutting it or having pre-cut little pieces, however big you want. You can have them really small, you can have them really big. It depends what you're gonna use, um, be used for this activity. <laughs> so you're gonna need, second step is to plug in the iron. So we're just gonna plug it in. Make sure it's turned on, awesome. Uh, always be safe when you're using an iron. So if you're doing this activity at home, just make sure if you're pretty young that your parents are helping you do this or um, that you can do it with supervision or if you're comfortable, whatever you're comfortable with. The third step is to grate the beeswax onto a plate. Um, so for the sake of the demo, I'm not really gonna grate it, but remember to use the big grating side um, because you're gonna want it pretty, like, pretty good flakes. Um, I wouldn't recommend using these small sides because it can get just get stuck in there and it's pretty hard to clean afterwards. All right, so you're gonna place the uh, pre-cut cotton from this one onto the baking sheet without the wax paper on it. Just like that. And the baking sheet has to be flipped upside down because it is a flatter uh, surface. So it just works a lot better. So you're gonna place it upside down like that. We're gonna make sure our iron is nice and hot. The fifth step is to sprinkle the beeswax on the cloth, kind of like you're making a pizza. That's what I always like to use for this. So just take pretty good chunks and just sprinkle it all around there. Um, just break it up if there's, you've got really big chunks. It should be pretty easy because this stuff is really soft and it smells really good. So you're just gonna sprinkle it all along like that and make sure it's a little bit everywhere because it doesn't really spread once you've melted it down. All right. And then you're gonna place the wax paper on top of the cotton cloth. Just like that. Make sure everything's nice and flat. 
And then you're going to use your iron to kind of smooth out and melt the, uh, the beeswax. So just use the it's kind of like for me it's kind of so you're just going to do this until all of it is melted and it shouldn't take too long but my iron isn't super hot right now so it might take it might take a second so you can already see it starting to melt over here and you're just going to use a circular motion to kind of spread out the beeswax make sure it's kind of everywhere so these beeswax wraps are really good. Um, they're a really good alternative to plastic wrap is because plastic wrap can be kind of annoying. It's kind of uh, sticky and clings to itself and sometimes it gets tangled. Um, but these don't really get tangled and they're really good for if you put them in the fridge, they stick really well and they're wrapped around like a bowl or a container. All right, it looks like it's pretty melted. So it'll look kind of like this when it's um, when the beeswax melts and I missed a spot there as you can see. But it looks kind of like it's wet and it's really sticky. So then you can see all the dry spots around here that there's no beeswax. We're just going to put a little more just to uh, make sure it's all uh, saturated with beeswax. And then just do the same thing. And it's melted. So we did this workshop. Um, it was one of my first workshops to this speak. And we did it with uh, one of the leaders, Ms. Frankie. And she actually made kits like this that have tons of uh, wax paper, multiple irons, baking sheets, and lots of beeswax graders, things like that. So that you can actually, members of UPC can take it to schools. Or if they have like an environment club, they can take it to their school and um, do this with a bunch of people. So it's really good if you're looking for a quarantine project or um, just something to do that is a better alternative to plastic. Use it, use it quite a while. Um, if it's getting less sticky, you might just have to reheat the beeswax on the actual the cotton itself. Um, so you maybe use a hair dryer for that. And they're really easy to wash. You just use some cold water. Um, yeah, just cold water, a little bit of soap, and just hand wash them. It's super easy and just let them dry, and once they're dry, they're good to go again. All right, so that's looking all right. I'll finish this one. Yeah, I'll finish that later. Um, just be careful, it can be a little hot when it's just out of the iron like that. And just, um, yeah, let it dry. I'm just gonna let that one dry right there. And then when it's dry, you're good to go. So this is one I made out of a shirt, and it works really well. You can put it on top like that and just kind of stretch it. So like say this is a bowl I have food in it and I wanted to put, like conserve, like put it in the fridge. You scrunch it like that and it stays pretty well. So it keeps mold and then you can even take that out and it's still molded like that. So just give it a little scrunch and it stays. So it's pretty good. Uh, place. Um, so here are the materials and instructions. If you would like to take a screenshot or take a photo, of the materials and instructions so you can try this out um, for yourself at home. I'll leave this on for another few seconds. Um, so beeswax wrap you can make at home. It's something that is cost efficient and it is very useful to use. If um, there are other, um, sorry, if there are other types of cloth, um, as long as it's thin, then it would be very um, good to use. So doing something like this is a great alternative for our oceans. It helps reduce the amount of plastics that are used. And there are other people who are also doing um, other eco-friendly alternatives and projects to help conserve and protect the oceans. So I'd like to introduce you guys to two of our friends who are also in Youth to Sea Council. They are, oh, why is that not working? Okay, um, they are Charlotte and Sage. So Charlotte on the left, she has founded her own organization for her ocean service project and it's called Cut It Out. It's a plastic elimination initiative where her initial goal for creating this organization was to eliminate single use plastic cutlery that was provided to her school's cafeteria. So she had to go through a lot of process, a lot of talking and 
um, guiding the other students to help her as well. And she had OceanWise mentors um, also provide resource and help her with her organization. So now after having a plan, a draft, she knows what her goal is. She went to talk to the administrators at her school and she had to also present to some board of directors for the education. And she finally was able to have the single use plastic cutleries eliminated from her school. And now they are using a alternative material to produce the cutlery. And as of right now, she is currently working on creating some online ambassador program. Um, that way the participants will be taught what plastic pollution is. And there are also some hands-on activities that will engage them through the process. Sage on the right, he, uh, his project was the free water refill project. And it's basically also trying to reduce single use plastic water bottles um, by providing free tap water for people. And he had partnered up with local small businesses here in Vancouver um, by providing the sticker. So the free water refill sticker you see here would be on windows and doors of their businesses. And then customers of public would be able to see that and ask for free water. Um, provided that you have your own reusable water bottle. He also had partnered up with a smartphone app called MyMizu, and that app will allow the stations to be digitally mapped. And that way, when we are in the neighborhood, we can just go onto the app and take a look to see where we can get some free water. So with Charlotte and Sage, their projects were pretty complicated. They had to work out a lot of different things. They hit so many roadblocks, but there are still some smaller ways that we could do to contribute to ocean protection. So some other examples include selling some metal straws. Andre on the far left is another Youth to Sea Council member. He was selling these metal straws at his high school um, to also promote reducing the use of plastic straws. And he had also hosted a eco-friendly soap workshop. And then for Sophie and Elizabeth, um, more fellow Youth to See members, they did a Swap Don't Shop initiative where it's about fast fashion and fast fashion also contributes to or ocean health because of the microfibers um, that are in the clothes and the textiles. And then Lauren down here has um, hosted her own a beeswax wrap workshop at her school. So here she's teaching her fellow peers how to make them. And then there's also some stations set up for them to make the beeswax wrap themselves. We also have a um, photo of our OceanWise mentor. And they are right now hosting a shoreline ocean, sorry, a shoreline cleanup. So that's Jacob, Michelle, and Haley. And then we have our very own Yonatan. Would you like to speak about your project? Sure. Uh, so my project was bringing touch pools to my own school. So I reached out to my science teacher and to, uh, together we reached out to a program out in Victoria, which is another large city in British Columbia. So we, had, we were in contact with them and we brought in a 90 liter touch pool tank and aquarium that had over I think we had 20 species uh, we just had anywhere from anemones to urchins to snails to worms um, and it allowed us to connect students with the world that was under the water which usually you weren't able to see unless you go diving or you come to the aquarium so it was easy to connect kids with the world around them. Cool. Um, so these are just some examples of ocean service projects that we've been doing to help engage our community in um, understanding the importance of ocean health and what we can do as a better alternative. Yeah, so throughout the year we have a lot of projects going on. Uh, whether it be in person or online and if you guys ever want to get in contact with us or 
uh, come to one of our webinars or in-person meetings, uh, connect with us through Instagram at youth to see. Uh, we respond to pretty much anyone. Um, or you can reach out to Oceanwise Youth, and that is us and OceanBridge. OceanBridge is similar to Youth to See, but it's a larger scale and it's for people in their 20s. Um, and then, or you can come to our website at education.org slash youth to see, and there you can keep up with all of our projects that's going on. We also do volunteering with the aquarium, and through that you can summer we aren't having any more volunteers coming in but in the winter we have another cohort that you can join and you can also reach out to us through our email on there we all you also can keep up to date with our projects all right so it looks like our session our plan session is rather early we still have um quite some time for any questions if anyone has questions Um, well, I, I definitely have questions too while we wait for folks to submit some into the chat, if that's all right, y'all. You know, one of the questions I um, always have for people who are dedicating themselves to the work of uh, plastics and, and reading our ocean of plastics in particular, and Yonatan, you shared that startling statistic about the idea that at one point we might so at some point soon, we might have more plastics in the ocean than, than fish. How do you all stay optimistic in this work? Um, how do you um, kind of not become so overwhelmed by the scale of the problem that you're trying to address? So I, um, I do a lot of education with like small children. I work at the aquarium. I work with kids from four to 11 uh, doing camps and stuff with them. So for me, it's kind of trying to remain optimistic that with the new age coming in, we have new people coming in. And as more of us are becoming adults, the ability to make change increases tenfold. And it's, there's a new age coming in and we'll be able to channel our energy into climate. To kind of echo Yo-Yo and, and um, hopefully Natasha as well, um, we yeah, I think... work with kids, so it's, we're really, to be optimistic, we really like being able to be near kids and just youth in general because with a new perspective, it's always the best to have a brighter and a more positive outlook on things. So with plastic pollution being something that's such a major problem, it's a little disheartening knowing that not many people know what it is, so to be able to teach others on um, what it is and then hopefully they can also teach their peers what plastic pollution is is really motivating us to also continue educating youth through things like this and also through ocean service projects absolutely so did you have something you wanted to add to that yeah like it's just what carrie and yo you were saying i think many of us uh found our start in this through aqua camps and through volunteering at the aquarium and we can just see like what great work people are doing so for me, it keeps me optimistic by uh, seeing what everyone else is doing and seeing what other youth across the globe are doing and saying, you know what, like we're not alone in this fight against plastic pollution. We have allies, we have people that we can rely on as well. Um, so that's what keeps me optimistic. Yeah, and I feel like the I feel like folks are moving in your direction. You know, even in the past few years, I've seen just a, a shift in consciousness among people who are like aware of the plastic problem and trying to kind of adjust their behavior. Um, but, but Natasha, you kind of brought up um, where you got your start and you know, a question that Bailey just uh, submitted in the chat. What are some tips that you all have for other young people who wanna start advocating uh, plastic-free schools, businesses, but um, maybe aren't sure uh, how to get involved? Um, so I actually, I can relate. It's, it's hard to wanna be involved. Like, I feel like everyone want, everyone knows the issue and everyone wants to be involved and everyone is conscious about it. But taking that step can be nerve wracking. Um, one of the best ways, or I found to keep myself uh, like wanting to be involved is uh, if you look, check with one of your local aquariums or zoos, a lot of times you can volunteer with them. And through volunteering, I 
that's how I got started with UCT. I was originally a volunteer and then I got connected with all these guys. So just trying to connect or even going to like this after school clubs, they may sound a little bit nerdy, but they're actually quite fun and you can get involved through those. Yeah, so I think that um, one of the, I mean, obviously passion for what you do, um, but if you really want to start some sort of business or some sort of campaign for advocating for the oceans, um, something that would definitely be beneficial is networking. So networking for resources, networking with peers, trying to engage community and to also understanding and uh, where you're coming from and believing in the same thing that you believe in, um, we'll be able to have a stronger kind of foundation for your um, business or whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, also, I think that when you're trying to advocate for the ocean or plastic free kind of schools or businesses, um, you can also just do some research and just Google on the internet and be like, hey, what did this person do? Or what did this person do um, to get their campaign going? Um, if you would like, I can also type in the link to, if you want to um, email Charlotte. Charlotte's uh, the founder of Cut It Out, and she started from literally rock bottom, and then she had to figure out how she's going to manage it, how she's going to act, like connect with people, how she had to um, present to the board of directors for education to get the initiative going. Um, so she had to go through a lot of challenges, and I would definitely say she is someone who is a really good resource because she can give you first-hand experience what she had to go through to do all that. So I can type in, in the chat box her contact information or her site at the very least. Um, Natasha, do you have any tips? Yeah, I don't know if I'm frozen anymore. Sorry, my You're internet not frozen is anymore, terrible huh? today. Um, <laughs> I would just say get involved because it took me so long to actually um, get involved with an organization, even if you don't even if you don't have any organizations that are local to you that you're like, well, I don't really know if we value the same thing. Um, I would just say like, see what other youth are doing and don't be afraid to reach out and um, just ask, ask questions because you never know like what kind of inspiration you can draw from others and how you can enact change because everyone's different and was unique. So just find your own way of doing it. And if that's by being involved in the organization, that's how it is. And if that's not, then just do what you, feel you're most comfortable with and your passion is. Natasha, that last piece of advice I think is really great. I just remember you know, I first got involved with activism because when I was, you know, when I was a freshman in high school, there was a senior that was doing work that was so cool. And I was like, mm -hmm. wow, you know, I, they're not that much older than me. They go to the same school to me. Like I, I can do that too. And I think those kinds of like mentors, you know, not even that much older can can be really powerful. Um, mm -hmm. I also just wanted to say um, we've been adding to this document that I just uh, dropped here in the chat room for folks that weren't here when we started this. This is a crowdsource uh, place where people are adding uh, things to read, um, programs to apply for, people to follow. So if either of you have any uh, tips or um, uh, in initiatives that you think people should be aware of, please throw them in that in that document. So and we're hoping that by the end of this, we can have a list of things. Um, because, you know, I think it was Carrie that said, you know, it's so important to network, to have that network, to know what opportunities are out there, because we're all constantly learning from one another. Um, we did get another question in the chat. Um, Michael asked, how do you balance being an activist and a student? And I'm really interested in this answer because I kind of struggled with this in the past too, and my GPA will attest to that. <laughs> um, okay, so for me, uh, being a university student, I had to do a lot of time management and figuring out what is my workload. So most of the things that I do to manage my time, I actually have a, a bullet journal that I use and I allocate um, like time slots in there. I write down some key things and I also set these like fake deadlines. Um, so for example, to create this uh, PowerPoint presentation going on, I had set up these knowing that today's the 20th. Then I was like, okay, I need to set up these fake deadlines for when I need to get this part of the PowerPoint done. And then the next part done. That way I know that I have gotten certain things done. 
um, also, then I can also allocate some other time for my other assignments and courses that I'm taking because I am taking some summer courses right now. Um, but time management is essential. And so this is just the journal that I use. Um, but I was able to manage my time pretty well with that. And I was also very motivated to be activist for environment simply because I'm very passionate about the oceans. Um, and also for schoolwork, um, being able to manage your course load was very important um, and attending lectures uh, instead of going to those um, pre-recorded ones because whenever it's pre-recorded you might not be motivated to actually attend those pre-recorded lectures whereas in-person lectures um, where it's like live on the screen um, those you would attend once and then you have your notes down whatever to review and then you also do other assignments as your time goes on um, so time management was something that I found really useful in being able to balance doing youth to see stuff and being a student. Um, I don't know what Yo-Yo and Natasha has in mind. Um, I know personally, I'm a horrible student. I don't know how my teachers stand me because I can't, school is just not my thing, but um, I'm a new university student, so I'll be in university in September. And um, yeah, I don't really know how I'm gonna manage it, but I find what's worked for me in the past um, it's really just being determined and kind of saying, okay, you know what, I'm going to procrastinate later, but right now this is something that's really important that I have to get done. So whether, I don't know how I balance, I still don't really know how I balance being an activist and a student, but I'm hoping with journaling and with some proper scheduling and proper determination, I can really get it done. I, I probably have the worst attitude of the three of us. I'm just going... There's, uh, I'm the youngest out of the group. I'm only going into grade 10. So I still don't really worry about the schoolwork. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm in the act, I'm a lot more active in terms of like doing uh, conservation work than trying to worry about my school. And so I should probably start thinking about that, but. Well, you know, I, the piece that I would add that is just clear from you all's presentation is that um, as part of your activism, you are constantly learning new things. And I mean, just your ability to kind of give this presentation today and talk about all the different amazing work that you're doing and your, under, your kind of um, understanding of the nuances of, of plastic pollution. That, I've always found that the best way to learn is by doing, um, and you all know so much. So, um, you know, I think sometimes people, and I, you know, I think this is a product of the way we do education, especially in America. Um, they kind of think you have to, you know, have your student in school world and then your activist world is kind of separate. But I mean, my, the best learning experiences have been in the Capitol advocating for things that I believe in. And I think, you know, folks should really embrace that when they can. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left in the session. I wanted to give you kind of each a chance to uh, share any kind of final thoughts or um, anything. Oh, actually, sorry. There was actually one more question. <laughs> Show up. Um, what are your favorite plastic free alternatives that you use the most? Who would like to go first? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you go first this time. I go, I, I went first most of the time, but okay. Um, so, in terms of plastic, I got this cool, um, I got, we volunteer and we're not supposed to, sometimes like we volunteer and sometimes people like give us gifts, like gift cards and stuff. I don't know if you guys, I've gotten a couple of gift cards. Anywho. I haven't gotten any. <laughs> someone, someone gave me this, like, homemade, like, pouch thing. Like, one their kids made at, at, at a different camp. And it was cool. And it was made out of all plants, all plant-free stuff. So I use it for a, if I, I have my backpack, and I use it for storing all my coins in my backpack. So I don't need to scavenge around for it. Okay, cool, that's neat. Um, I, mine's a little more because I like to drink bubble tea and I know it's not good for my health, but it's bubble tea. 
So um, all those single use plastic cups with the plastic straws and the plastic seal is pretty wasteful. So I have a reusable bubble tea cup. It's a chrome straw, a rainbow chrome straw, also reusable. And then this is easy seal, easy open. It fits for one large bubble tea. So I use this for bubble tea. And there are also times when I'll also have these paper straws that I use. Um, so these are little turtle designs. I don't know if you can see it that well. But there's little turtles on them. And this on the back it says sea turtles approved. So paper straws, bubble tea, reusable bubble tea uh, cup. Those are some of the things that I use to help reduce plastic usage, some eco-friendly alternatives. Kara, you beat me to it. I was going to say I really like those, um, those paper straws that we got. <laughs> well, I, I got them from a workshop. I believe it was a workshop I was at at the aquarium. And, the same um, workshop, yeah. I bet. That's also at the workshop. Yeah. <laughs> it was the same workshop, and uh, they were just giving them out, and I was like, all right, cool. And uh, I put them in my backpack, never thinking I'd use them. I was like, you know, I have, like, metal straws that I normally use, so it's like, I never thought I was going to use them, but then it came really in handy when everyone else around me was like, I don't have a straw. And I was like, I have straws. Here you go. And they've loved them. So that's my favorite um, plastic alternative. Which workshop was this? <laughs> I don't think you were there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, go ahead, Yo Yo. So I, someone in the chat was saying bamboo, uh, bamboo straws. So yeah, or like bamboo cutlery. Yeah, they're awesome. Yeah, and then uh, Billy mentioned upcycling, and upcycling is actually a lot of fun too. Um, I upcycle fabric, so old clothes that I usually uh, just outgrew from, then I'll upcycle it. So this is actually uh, I had this dress that was like wide. I didn't fit me, um, so. I had cut it out two squares and made a like a small pillow with it. Um, so just so I don't need to buy any more new fabric, I have the dress fabric. So that's upcycling. That's and then there's cute. also some friends. Thank you. <laughs> there's also some friends from Youth to See who had upcycled some uh, fabric to make scrunchies. Uh, Risa, a fellow Youth to See member, had also upcycled fabric to make scrunchies. So upcycling is a lot of fun. It can be a lot of work. I don't know how many guys are good at sewing, but I love sewing. It's something that I like to do just when I have time. So this was fun to make and it was upcycling. If you guys want uh, projects that you can do for like upcycling or reusing stuff, uh, the van, uh, the OceanWise website and the Youth to See website have a lot of fun options for doing stuff like that. I don't know if you guys talked about it before, but there's also the swap it out challenge where they take like you take things that have plastic cover, like wrapping or whatever and you swap it out for something reusable. Um, that's part promotion wise as well. So if you guys need a challenge <laughs> for upcycling or, reuse, or finding a different something to use, then definitely uh, get some ideas from there. And there's also Online Oceans, which is an, uh, like the education department from OceanWise, where they put together these resources for activities to do at home as well. So I can also post that down in the chat. Um, I think it's so hilarious, Carrie, how you have all these props just within your... <laughs> I'm sitting in literally everything right now. You can't see it yet, but there's still some stuff near me. <laughs> like, these are not pre-planned questions, but you have all the props. Um, <laughs> but great examples too, and I, that's so smart with what you did with the dress. And um, um, Natasha, also you talking about how um, it's not only about having stuff for yourself, but also like sometimes it's good to have stuff for people around you. Um, kind of reminds you of like the influence that each of us can have in our own kind of local friend groups, local communities. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, I think, uh, I don't think we have any more questions and we're running up on time. So I, I did just want to kind of end by saying thank you uh, to the three of you for uh, joining us, uh, spending an hour of your Saturday with us. I think you, uh, your presentation was, was really, were really great and informative. And 
um, you know, the demonstration as well. I think all of us are going to be uh, trying to figure out how to use beeswax more, um, you know, as 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 a as a replacement, as a plastic replacement here in the next uh, few days. So I appreciate you all putting some time into this and making it such a thoughtful uh, presentation. And um, I hope to stay connected with you all. <laughs> Thank you. It was Thank you so much.